A ruling by a Texas judge may stop the distribution of the abortion pill in America. Also, NPR shills for abortion by exploiting the tragedy of a mother who endured the loss of her baby. And at the beginning, some quick thoughts on the gospel and salvation. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use promo code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Monday. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can tell it's a little different. Also, if you're listening to this, you can probably tell it's a little bit different too. I have a different setup this week, a remote setup. I'm out of town and so um, am unable to be in my regular studio. I hope everyone had a wonderful Easter weekend. We did. We spent time with family. We went to church, all that good stuff. And then we also went to the Masters this weekend, which was so fun. We went on Saturday and Sunday. We didn't think that we were going to get to go on Sunday, but then some friends came through for us on Saturday. If you're a golf fan at all, you were watching. It was miserably cold and rainy. I don't like to complain about it because it's such a privilege to get to even go to the Masters, and it was still really fun. But man, oh man, it was a high of 50. And I mean, we Southerners have a hard time with that kind of weather, but it was also windy and very rainy. So it was very cold, not a great day to watch golf, but it was still a good experience. I mean, we walked so much. We really, because we thought that that was the only day that we were going to get to go. My husband, who is a big golf fan, he wanted to walk the entire course, see everything, watch some players, but we really just wanted to take in the experience which of course, if you know, you know, includes the pimento cheese sandwiches, the peach ice cream sandwiches, which are all, this is part of the charm of the masters, the uniqueness of the masters. They're all like $2 and under. So that's really fun. And, but then we got to go back surprise. We got to go back on Sunday and it was actually beautiful. The weather was great. So after some Easter festivities in the morning, we got to go and that was great. It was a really, it was a really, really fun weekend. And I hope you all had a really fun weekend as well. One thing that I was thinking about the resurrection and go back and listen to Thursday's episode. If you haven't already with an apologetics pastor and a new Testament scholar talking about the proof that we have for the resurrection, such an encouraging conversation and per your request, I will definitely be having him back. I think we'll probably do some kind of series with him and just ask the apologetics questions or the questions that you have about the faith and, uh, the Bible to him. I think that would be really fun. So Uh, One thing that I was thinking about, though, because I got this message and I think conservative Christians get this kind of message or get this kind of comment a lot. And I don't say this for you guys to feel bad for me or anything like that. You guys know I've chosen to have this job and talk about the things that I do. So I've been dealing with mean, spiteful messages for a long time, but and I, I don't really talk about them, but This kind of message, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to because you've probably heard something like this in your own life. If you've ever stood for life inside the womb or you've ever stood for a so-called controversial topic, like the reality of God making us male and female, things like that, that have turned into these culture war hot button issues today. And this person messages me, obviously progressive. You can tell because the pronouns are in the profile, what they post about. And she says, you know, people like you are the exact reason I'm not a Christian anymore. And like I said, don't feel bad for me because the number of messages that I get of positivity and encouragement uh, so far outnumber those kinds of messages. Of course, those kinds of messages, they come through and they can be hurtful or some kinds of messages can be hurtful and mean and all that kind of stuff. But the messages and the emails and the interactions, the conversations that I have with the vast, vast, vast majority of you that are encouraging, that are edifying, that are uplifting, that tell me that by God's grace, he's used something that I said or something that I wrote or something that one of my guests said to either change your mind on something consequential or even help you understand the gospel. Um, They so far outweigh any of those negative messages. Actually, an amazing tweet the other day from one of you saying that, Um, you were suicidal, you were in the throes of postpartum depression, but then you were listening to my podcast and you heard the gospel for the first time, even after having grown up in the church. 
and it changed your life, not me, but the gospel itself. That's just what the grace of God does. So those kinds of messages are, they are many times more than this kind of message, but okay, let me get to, let me get to my point. Uh, this person said, you know, you're the kind of person that made me not be a Christian anymore. And I'm sure you guys have heard something like that. And it could be really difficult. You can wonder, okay, should I not be talking about the things that I do? Should I just be like, oh, you know, whatever you want to do is great. We're just supposed to be all about acceptance and tolerance and just nice and never talk about any con anything controversial or divisive, quote, unquote. But the reality is whenever you get a message like that or hear a comment like that, and you're tempted to think, wow, maybe I shouldn't say the controversial truth about these things. Maybe it is too mean to say that men can't be women or life inside the womb matters, whatever it is. Keep in mind, keep in mind that that person is not an unbeliever because of you or because of any other person. That person is an unbeliever because they don't believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, period. They don't believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with the negative interaction that they had with a Christian. Has nothing to do with political disagreements. It has nothing even to do with maybe very real and very valid and very sad um, uh, past experiences that they've had with the church. Maybe they even suffered real and horrible and unjust kind of abuse from the church. All of those things might be true, or maybe they just had a disagreement that they counted as bigotry or whatever. All of those things might be true, but none of those reasons are the ultimate reason why anyone is not a Christian. Anyone is who is not a Christian is not a Christian because they don't believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected. If you believe that this person named Jesus predicted his own death and predicted being raised again, then that changes everything. You have to listen to everything that he has to say. That validates everything that he said before he was raised from the dead. If you believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, that he then is God made flesh, that the, he then ascended to be at the right hand of the father. If you then believe as a consequence of believing in the fact of the resurrection, that he was actually God and that he was sacrificed on our behalf to reconcile us to a holy God who requires um, a payment for our sins then it doesn't matter what anyone has said to you. It doesn't matter the negative interactions that you've had with people. It doesn't matter the maybe poor influence that has been had on you by someone who misrepresented Christ. It doesn't matter if you believe that someone is a bigot or offensive or divisive or whatever. None of those things would be a big enough obstacle to you in believing in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The resurrection is way bigger than anyone's personality, anyone's political views, any bad interaction that someone may have had with a Christian. And so I understand people try to put that responsibility on you. Like you tell too much truth or you're too political or you're too divisive or your tone was off or you don't say the things that I want you to say, or you hurt me. You legitimately betrayed me at some point, And that's why I'm not a Christian. All of those things may have made a legitimately a bad impression on a person. And I'm not saying those things. Some of those things are good. Some of those things are fine, but some of the bad interactions that people have had with a Christian, none of those are the ultimate reason why anyone on earth is not a Christian. Anyone who is not a Christian is not a Christian because they don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Therefore, they don't believe that he's God. They don't believe that his death was a sufficient sacrifice for our sins. They don't believe in the gospel. That is ultimately why they are not a Christian. So you, Christian, don't allow yourself to be beholden to a comment like that or to be beholden to the opinions of unbelievers. Remember, the gospel is a stench of death to those who are dying, to those who are not in Christ. And so, yes, we should speak the truth in love. Yes, we should try to be as persuasive as possible. But don't allow comments like that or the fear of comments like that to inhibit you from speaking 
the truth, from saying what needs to be said, of course, the world is always going to call it mean. It doesn't matter how kindly you say it, how lovingly you say it, how empathetically you say it. If you go against the progressive, secular, humanist zeitgeist of today, you are still going to be called a bigot. You are still going to be told you're the reason why people hate Christians. No, people hate Christians because they hate Christ, period. So just keep that in mind. I hope that actually encourages you to be bold. Remember Ephesians 1, 5, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons before he laid the foundations of the world. Okay. So even though we should do our absolute best to be proper representations of Christ and to be by the power of the Holy Spirit ambassadors of his love and his gospel, understand that God's sovereignty cannot be thwarted by a bad impression that someone gets of Christians because of what they deem to be a negative interaction. All right. I was just thinking about that last night and I just wanted to encourage you in that to keep going, to be bold and don't be inhibited by other people's opinions or what you think that they might say. That's not what we're beholden to. We are not looking for the approval of man, but the approval of God. So continue to speak the truth and love without fear. All right, let's get into the stories that we want to talk about today. Let me just go ahead and pause though. Let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day since we're already a few minutes uh, a few minutes in and that is Cozy Earth. All right, I love Cozy Earth. I love the products that they make. They make amazing loungewear. I love it. I wear it all the time. I wear the pajamas that they sent me almost every night because they're so comfortable. Also, I absolutely love our Cozy Earth sheets. So it's made from bamboo. It's made from viscous, which is temperature regulating, very cool. And you can use it. I mean, obviously you can use it all year, but especially like going into these summer months when it's really hot and you want your bed to feel cool. I honestly think that that helps you sleep better. Cozy earth. No one does it better than them. So soft, so luxurious. You feel like you are sleeping on a million dollar sheets. I can always tell when our cozy earth sheets are on because they're so different, even from like the nice brands of other sheets that we have cozy earth, my absolute favorite. You can save 35% on cozy earth bedding right now. Go to cozy earth.com slash alley, enter my promo code alley, save 35%. That's an amazing deal. It's a huge discount. They're giving my listeners cozy earth.com slash alley to save that 35% cozy earth.com slash alley. All right, before we even get into the Texas story about the ruling from the judge about uh, about uh, me, 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 uh, okay, how do I pronounce this? I, I okay, me, mifepristone, mifepristone. I always get, uh, I always forget which syllable needs the emphasis when we're talking about that horrid abortion pill. It's mifepristone. So we're going to talk about this and that kind of is the context for this story. But because so many of you sent me this NPR story, I wanted to start with this and react to it. So many of you asked me to respond to it. And the summary is that NPR published a story last week, April 6th, about a Texas mom who they believe tragically could not get an abortion at 20 weeks due to Texas's abortion law restricting abortion after a heartbeat is protected. So they were hoping to, and they successfully did this on Instagram, provoke sympathy for women who have to bring their pregnancies to term because of what they would call this draconian abortion law that was made possible by the Dobbs decision that was published last year that overturned Roe v. Wade. So here is the caption, and we'll put up uh, some of the pictures that they put up in this uh, on this Instagram post. Here's the caption from NPR. Her name was Halo, and she was born in Texas last week on March 29th, two months early, and weighing three pounds. She lived for four hours, dying in the arms of her father, uh, Louis Valisana, or it's probably uh, Viasana. Her mother, Samantha Cassiano, knew their baby wouldn't survive long because she had um, an encephaly, part of Halo's brain and skull, never developed. Now they can't afford to give their newborn daughter the funeral they would like to give her. Cassiano got the diagnosis three days after Christmas. 
at a prenatal appointment when she was 20 weeks pregnant. I was told that she's incompatible with life. She says I was crushed. She asked her OBGYN what her options were. Cassiano says her doctor told her, well, because of the new law, you don't have any options. You have to go on with your pregnancy. Texas has among the strictest abortion laws in the country, says NPR, with three overlapping bans. One abortion ban predated Roe v. Wade. Another was triggered when Roe was overturned and comes with a maximum penalty of life in prison for providing, not getting, but providing an abortion in Texas. There's also SB8, which allows people to bring civil charges for aiding or abetting an abortion in the state. So that means that you're not going to go to jail um, for for doing so, but you could have to pay some kind of fine. We talked about SB8 when it was passed a while ago. Cassiano knew that Texas banned abortions, but she didn't think these laws would apply in a situation where the fetus was certain to die. But the laws do apply. A narrow exception allows abortions for when the mother's life or a major bodily function is in imminent danger. But there are no exceptions in Texas law for the diagnosis of a fetal anomaly, no matter how severe. In fact, very few states with abortion bans have such exceptions. Cassiano wishes she could have ended the pregnancy in Texas as soon as she got the anencephaly diagnosis. And so that's basically the summary of the entire entire article. And if you look at the comments, the comments are exactly what NPR was hoping to to provoke all of these women saying, wow, this is so awful that this mother had to go through this. How awful that this mother had to hold her baby after the baby was born. How awful that they have to pay for a funeral now. How tragic. And people saying, well, Texas, the taxpayers should have to cover the funeral costs of this family to be able to um, bury their child. So here's what's implicit. In all of this, what's implicit in all of this, even though they don't say it outright, this is the entire point of the article. The point is that she should have just been able to abort her baby at 20 weeks. Then she wouldn't have had to pay for a funeral. Then I guess she wouldn't have had to deal with the trauma of birthing her baby and holding her baby. How, how am I supposed to be sad about that fact? I am very sad that this child had a fetal anomaly. You can't really survive anencephaly. Really, sometimes in rare cases, the baby might live past a few hours, maybe sometimes a few weeks, at least from what I've read. I don't have personal experience from this, but from the information that we've gathered in our research, there really isn't some kind of cure for this. And so I'm very sad that these parents, this mom and dad had to experience this. From what I've read, this was a very wanted baby. And so any parent would feel absolutely crushed to hear that at the 20 week anatomy scan. I just had my own 20 week um, anatomy scan. And of course you're going in with so many nerves, just hoping that the doctor, the sonographer tells you that everything is okay. And maybe you're waiting uh, until then to find out the gender. And so there's so much excitement at that point. You've been able to feel probably uh, your baby start kicking And so I really feel for this mother. I feel for this father who wanted this baby, who went into their 20 week anatomy scan, so excited to see their little baby's face only to find out that they, that she has this terrible anomaly that means that she won't survive. So I feel so much sadness and so much devastation for them knowing that they were absolutely crushed. And I also feel for her that for you know, 20 or so, well, I guess not 20 full weeks since this baby was born two months early, but several weeks after this, she probably felt her baby move. She felt this life inside of her. She knew that there was another heartbeat inside of her that she wasn't going to get to see grow up. All of the things that she bought for the nursery, all the plans that she had, the names that she had picked out. I mean, she knew that this child that she loved, that she created would not grow up to fulfill all of the milestones and all of the memories that she had already projected and predicted for her. So I feel so much sadness for this family. I do not feel sadness that they were not able to abort this child. Look, this child is still a human being made in the image of God. And either way, the child had to come out. And so why would I feel sadness that this child was not dismembered inside the womb? That doesn't make it better. And what NPR is saying, oh, they had to have 
Now they have to pay for a funeral. They have to pay for a funeral for this child. Okay, so you're admitting that there would have been no funeral for this moving, living child had she been aborted at 20 weeks gestation? I mean, that is a fully formed, except for in this case with the fetal anomaly, the skull wasn't fully formed. That's a fully formed, moving, kicking, heart beating child. So you are admitting that there, that this child would have just been discarded as, at, as toxic waste. Also, NPR is arguing that I guess there would not have been trauma had this mother aborted her child at 20 weeks. I'm sorry. I don't believe that. As you saw, if you're watching on YouTube, these sweet pictures, this mother got to hold on to her child before she died. She got to hold her little hand. She got to see her daughter's little face before she took her last breaths. You're telling me that that is more traumatic than knowing that you poisoned and then dismembered your child while she was wiggling inside your womb? I'm sorry, I don't buy that. I feel very badly for this family. I feel terrible for the child too, that she had to suffer. But why is it better? Why is it morally preferable for this child to suffer inside the womb rather than suffer outside of the womb? She got to see the face of her mother for her dying breath. She got to be held. She got to know how loved she was rather than just feeling the sterile and, and cold grip of the medical tools, the surgical tools that would have been used to tear her apart limb from limb. And yet most of the comments that you see in this NPR post are people saying how awful this is, how unsympathetic this is, that this isn't caring about women. This isn't caring about children. This is so cruel. How can you possibly do this? How could you think like if you have a if you have a heart and a mind and a soul that function, that it would be better to poison and dismember this baby that has to come out of the womb anyway. And so I am, again, I feel for this family. I don't see how this story should convince me that abortion needs to be less restricted. I, I don't understand this one. Like there are some stories out there that we've seen where the mothers almost die. And basically because of the neglect and the fear of the doctors and nurses, they don't do anything until this mother is literally about to take her dying breath. And then they remove the child from the womb. By the way, all pro-lifers understand that there is a reason to remove the child from the womb if the mother is about to die. And as NPR even admits, Texas law, all pro-life law, uh, pro laws in America allow for that. Like if the mother in, in Texas, it even says a major bodily function is being disrupted or is being damaged in some way. It doesn't even have to be death. The baby can actually be aborted. Now, pro-lifers would say early delivery is the option. The child has to be removed from the womb anyway. So even if the child dies minutes after birth, that is better than the dismemberment and the poisoning of abortion. But look, if a woman is pregnant, she's 19 weeks. We know that baby isn't going to survive outside the womb, but she is dying because of this pregnancy. The baby has to be removed. We understand that a choice has to be made. And we do believe that the baby should be delivered at that point. Texas law allows for that. Pro-life laws allow for that. And unfortunately, either because of the hospitals, the hospital associations, the um, uh, lawyers that represent these hospitals that are choosing to be opaque or choosing to be vague or choosing to fear monger, maybe for the sake of politics, a lot of doctors, I guess, are operating under fear and won't actually protect their patients in these very difficult situations. And so that, okay, might be a reason to make these laws as crystal clear as possible to ensure that these laws are um, extremely transparent when it comes to saving the life of the mother and things like that. However, this doesn't convince me at all that these laws are problematic. This particular story just sounds like a tragedy that was endured but that ended in a way that at least allowed for 
a moment of love and connection between parents and her child that abortion never would have. Abortion would have just ended in destruction and death and cruelty and brutality. And so it's really sad. It's really sad for me that the commenters don't see that. And I'm, you know, I, I will pray for this family. I mean, they, this will stick with them forever, but I am glad that they got to see their precious daughter's face before she took her last breath. This is happening. These stories are still going to be churned out by outlets like NPR, which Twitter just specified is state funded media. It is, it's funded by the U S and it is going to repeat all of the democratic talking points. It always does. Um, these stories are going to continue to be propagated by outlets like NPR because there is a continued battle about access or over access to abortion, including the abortion pill, which is very popular among women who are seeking abortions. And so that is, um, the latest development in this, in this war that centers on the so-called right to kill a child just because the child happens to be small and exists inside the womb. So we'll talk about the decision in just a second. Let me pause and tell you about our next sponsor for the day. And that is express VPN. This might be the product that I use the most because express VPN is always running in the background of all of my devices. A VPN protects your, um, it protects your location. It protects your identity. It protects the privacy of your internet activity when you are online. So whether you're on your phone, your iPad, or, uh, your computer, uh, if you are connected to Wi-Fi, then you're basically open to, um, hackers and to people who are preying upon your information to try to figure out more about you, trying to sell your data and express VPN protects you from all of that. And it's super easy to use. There are lots of different VPNs out there. I think express VPN is the best, not just because it's effective, but because all you have to do is download the app and then your account is good on five devices. So you can share it with your family members in your household if you want to, and then you're protected. I feel really good knowing that I've got a VPN on. So even if I'm in public and I'm connected to Wi-Fi, that my identity, that my information is all protected. And it's also cool because you can change your location. Um, and so you can say that you're in, I don't know, Vancouver, Canada, even if you are in Greenville, South Carolina, and you actually are able to access different content on your streaming services because there are different libraries of content depending on where you are in the world. And so that kind of opens you up to some different options too. So I really recommend for a variety of reasons to get a VPN and to use the VPN that I use and trust, and that's Express VPN. Uh, you can go to expressvpn.com slash Allie, expressvpn.com slash Allie to get an extra three months for free. Expressvpn.com slash Allie, expressvpn.com slash Allie. All right, let's talk about the abortion pill. Um, okay, so there is a judge, a Trump appointed judge, and his name is Matthew Kazmarek. Kazmarek also had to look at the pronunciation of that last name to make sure I had it correct. So he is the United States District Judge of the uh, District Court for the Northern District of Texas. Like I said, he's a Trump appointed justice. He issued a ruling which could stop the prescribing and distribution of uh, mifepristone, one of two drugs used to perform abortions via a pill. So this pill is typically used in the first six to eight weeks of pregnancy. After that, we've gone through the different methods for abortion and they get I mean, they're all brutal because you are all in a very violent way, ending the life of an innocent and defenseless human being who has been a human being since the point of conception. But as far as the description goes, it really gets more and more invasive and more violent and brutal the further into pregnancy that you go. But 
this is still murder. It's still killing a child, even if it's just through a pill. And so obviously pro-lifers, pro-life organizations and uh, pro-life legislators have tried to stop the distribution and the prescription of this pill, which has been advocated for very fiercely by the Biden administration. It's also been used as a way to get around some state laws that ban abortion. People have been able to get pills from places that are outside of their red state so that they can kill their child between six to eight weeks. And there has also been decisions made that make it easy for someone to get this via mail and to not even have to see a doctor. I mean, consider that. Think if you are a woman who believes that you are six weeks pregnant, but maybe you are actually 12 weeks pregnant. Obviously, that's going to be dangerous for the child inside your womb, but that's also going to be very dangerous for you. That child is going to be really too big to be just passed through you. You are going to end up having to go to the emergency room, and that also puts a woman's life in jeopardy. So for the people who say you're pro-abortion pill, you're pro-abortion pill by mail, you shouldn't even have to see a midwife or a nurse or a doctor or anything to see how far along you are in your pregnancy because you're pro-woman. No, you're not. You might be pro-death, but you're not pro-woman. This is not safe for women either. And it's obviously, because abortion never is, safe for the child inside the womb. Um, so he actually stayed his opinion, this judge, for seven days to allow the Biden administration time to appeal. Shortly after the opinion came out, a Washington state federal judge issued a contradictory ruling. The conflict could eventually escalate the battle to the Supreme Court. And this all stems from a lawsuit that was filed by the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, arguing that the FDA never had the authority to approve the drug. I love Alliance Defending Freedom. Like I would recommend supporting them financially if you can. They and a lot of other freedom-loving, human rights-loving uh, law firms are just doing incredible work. And like we should be all grateful and support them however we can. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about this and what actually what actually went on here. So as I said, this is a very popular method for abortion. Uh, more than half of abortions in the U.S. are completed using pills. And so if this ruling prevails, if the Trump appointee judge's ruling prevails, this could mean the biggest blow to abortion, abortion access since Roe v. Wade was overturned. It would make it really difficult for women to obtain an abortion for a lot of women who um, they haven't gone into Planned Parenthood or they don't live, a, live in a state where they can go into a Planned Parenthood and um, get an abortion. And it's not entirely clear at this point how the ruling is going to affect the immediate availability of this of this drug. Um, some people are saying that we shouldn't enforce or that the FDA shouldn't follow this ruling at all, or that they don't even have to follow the ruling. Um, the FDA is probably going to appeal the decision, but the legal status of the drug is probably going to be the subject of confusion for a while, especially with this other ruling coming out of Washington, um, and so this has been on the market for a long time. Obviously, after the overturning of Roe v. Wade, there has been a fight over it, whether this should be available available or not. So uh, Kazmarek, he said in his ruling that the FDA rushed the process to approve this drug and actually violated federal standards. He says the court does not second guess FDA's decision making lightly, but here FDA acquiesced on its legitimate safety concerns in violation of its statutory duty based on plainly unsound reasoning and studies that did not support its conclusions. Kazmarek also hinted that the agency might have given into political pressure to approve the drug and alleged that it stonewalled any potential challenges to its approval. He found that the approval process for mifepristone was flawed, which would revoke access not just in the district where the case happened, but the entire, but the entire country. 
So Kaczmarek is talking about when the FDA approved this pill 20 years ago. He's saying that they basically prevented any judicial review of this decision until now. That's why it's taking 20 plus years for a judge to rule on this. He's saying that it was 20 years ago that they rushed the process, that they were listening to political pressure rather than looking at the real safety of the drug. Because as we mentioned, there are a lot of side effects that come to this drug, whether or not you actually see a doctor uh, before you are prescribed the drug. There are a lot of side effects and the FDA approved it. This judge is saying not based on science, but because of political pressure, which we know is true of the FDA, but he's saying that this has been true for a very long time. And so This is just going to cause a lot of chaos and confusion, but for right now, it does look like this is a win in the way of protecting that life in inside, inside the womb. Also, it's important to note that in 2016, the FDA increased the gestational age of the unborn baby when abortion drugs are allowed from seven weeks to 10, reduced the number of required office visits from three to one, allowed non-doctors to prescribe and administer the pills and eliminated their requirement for prescribers to report non-fatal adverse events from chemical abortion pills. And in 2021, during the Um, during COVID and after Joe Biden was elected president, the FDA announced that it would allow abortion pills, as we already stated, to to be dispensed through the mail. And so Kaczmarek's concerns about what they did 20 years ago, I would say they're even bigger concerns today, that it's obvious that this is not about health. This is not about women's rights even. It's not about protecting them. It's not even about bodily autonomy. It's actually about making babies and their moms as vulnerable as possible. I mean, you are risking so many lives with a move like this because the abortion lobby is not only so powerful, but it's also irrational. And that is, of course, as we've talked about what sin does to you, it gives you a heart of stone and a brain of mush. Like you aren't even able to think logically, much less compassionately about the consequences of your decisions. So how is the left reacting to this? Of course, Screaming like banshees, Um, I would say in addition to gender ideology advocates, abortion advocates, especially I'm talking like the activist class, the shout your abortion type people, which I would say accounts for a larger percentage of people on the left who are pro-abortion than a lot of people on the left want to admit, including Democrats in Congress. They are cruel. They are violent. They are, as I said, irrational. In some cases, I think demon possessed. Like if you look at the reaction to the overturning of Roe v. Wade that just said states can states can decide the firebombing of pregnancy clinics, the absolute slander and libel about what these pregnancy clinics do, just the outright hate and vitriol and violence and banshee like screaming from these people it's i mean there's no other explanation for this except for a worship of satan which i mean you you do whether you say that you're a satan worshiper and or not ephesians 2 makes that very clear. You are either worshiping the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, or you are worshiping Christ by grace through faith. And so definitely satanic following and satanic possession there. But I think it's extremely blatant when you're looking at gender ideology and abortion ideology. And so they worship abortion so much. They are are willing to sacrifice even children on the altar of progressive ideology that they are saying these anti-fascist leftists, they are basically saying that the federal government should override the checks and balances that are supposed to be provided by the judicial branch of the government and just say, nope, abortion pills for all. AOC was just talking to Anderson Cooper on CNN about this and Here is her recommendation. There has been thought, I believe, given to this. Senator Ron Wyden has already issued statements, uh, for example, advising what we should do in a situation like this, which I concur, which is that I believe that the Biden administration should ignore uh, this ruling. Yeah, so should ignore the ruling. Now, I know it gets tiresome to point out hypocrisy, but let's think about this just for a second, just for funsies. 
Let's think about if Republicans said, oh, I don't like a particular ruling, so we are just going to ignore it. They would call that fascism. They would call that Nazi-like somehow Christian nationalism, white supremacy. Oh, we're just going to override the checks and balances, which protect us from being a dictatorship, that protect us from just being a, a, a monarchy. This pro-democracy crowd says, well, we should just override the checks and balances to ensure that we get what we want. And these are the same people. These are the same people that make it such a huge deal when someone like Governor Ron DeSantis says, you know what, I'm going to use the tools constitutionally available to me to ensure that other entities like Disney, for example, are not trampling on the rights and the voices of the constituents in my state. They call that fascism. But it's not fascism when a president with an iron fist simply says, we are not going to ignore a ruling by a judge simply because we are that desperate to allow women to go hire someone to kill their babies. How do you not see? How do you not see that that's the side of evil? Like if you are a Christian or a professing Christian, how do you not see that? I understand that evil people are evil, evil gonna evil, depraved gonna depraved. Again, mushy brains, minds of oatmeal. I don't expect evil people to see that they're evil, but I hope people that fancy themselves discerning, that fancy themselves on the side of goodness, that fancy themselves certainly on the side of Christ would see, hmm, maybe those advocating for the slaughter of unborn children and who are willing to subvert the democratic processes that we've put in place to try to stave off tyranny are wicked. Like, I don't know, maybe that side is wicked. Uh, here is Xavier Becerra. He is the head of the Health and Human Services Department under Biden. I think signaling that they probably are going to ignore this ruling because according to him, this is just downright unpatriotic. What's your message to women and to medical providers who want to get this drug and use this drug? This is not America. What you saw by that one judge in that one court in that one state, that's not America. Uh, America goes by the evidence. America does what's fair. America does what is transparent and can, we can show that what we do is for the right reasons. I, that's not America. That's funny. That's funny. He was one of the most, probably the most pro-abortion uh, attorneys general of California that has ever existed. Of course, he believes himself to be a devout Catholic, but has been one of the most just brutally and vengefully pro-abortion officials in American history. I mean, the way that he targeted pro-life pregnancy centers when he was in California, when he was the attorney general of California, I mean, nothing short of just absolutely wicked absolutely evil. That's not America. Do you think Xavier Becerra has the authority to say what is America and what is not? And in another sense, maybe I'll agree. Maybe I agree with him. I mean, a lot of Americans, unfortunately, are very pro-abortion. But if he's talking about like American institutions, if he's talking about justice, if he's talking about liberty and justice for all and equality under the law, I'm not really sure that his opinion is sound. And it's just ironic that he's saying here, you know, we are transparent in America. We show that what we're doing is for the right reasons. He doesn't even take the time to explain himself. Has he ever taken the time to explain why he believes that poisoning and dismembering babies inside the womb is sound, is constitutional? I don't think he has because the left doesn't have to do that. They have the media, they have propaganda um, to cover for them. All right. Um, we've got Kamala Harris. Of course, she's got something to say about all of this. Well, I think she is trying to say something about all of this. I'll get to that in just a second. Let me pause and tell you about our third sponsor for the day. That's my Patriot Supply. So we know we know that the future is unstable. It's unreliable. 
We have no idea sometimes what the future holds. We just want to make sure that our families are protected as much as they can be, especially when it comes to our food supply. If the supply chain really is shot, if something happens in your area where you're not able to get to your food supply quickly, you just want to make sure that your family is taken care of. That's why my Patriot Supply exists. They sell these amazing three-month emergency food supply kits. And it's really good food. Lasts for three months. Of course, they last in storage for up to 30 years. Hopefully, you'll never need them. But if you do need them, at least they're there. At least that's one less thing to worry about for three months should you be in an emergency situation. You want to get one kit for every person in your family. It's like 2,000 calories a day. Good hearty stuff that can actually keep your family nourished in times of emergency. We have them. We've got them in storage. I'm glad that we have them. Go to mypatriotsupply.com. You'll save $200 on your three month emergency food kit. So knocking $200 off mypatriotsupply.com for that discount. It's also free shipping, which is amazing. Mypatriotsupply.com, mypatriotsupply.com. Okay, here's a vice president, Kamala Harris, reacting to what she believes is just such an egregious ruling by this judge. There is no question that the president and I are going to stand with the women of America and do everything we can to ensure that women have the ability to make decisions about their health care, their reproductive health care, in, in a manner that is, is, is what they need, and they decide that, not their government. What? What? Also, I just, I, I'm sorry. I know this is kind of petty, but her, I think her hand gestures are trying to overcompensate for the lack of strength in her words, the lack of security that she has in what she's saying and her ability to communicate because she tries to be so aggressive with her fists and with her hand motions. And it's actually, I think, overcompensating for her, um, the, just the instability, both in her voice and actually in the words that she chooses, her inability to really make coherent arguments or to ever really make a point in anything that she's saying. And if you follow the logic, if you can, of what she is attempting to argue here, really, she was, she would be saying that there should be no restrictions on abortion at all. So a woman should decide when and how she wants the child in her womb to be killed and the government shouldn't have anything to say about it. Now, why? Why shouldn't the government have anything to say about it? It's not just the woman's body. If it were just the woman's body, the government probably wouldn't have a lot to say about it. But by the way, like laws restrict what you can do with your body. That's not new. You don't have complete bodily autonomy. Your bodily autonomy stops when you are exercising that autonomy to infringe upon another person's right. So when people say, oh, I don't want the government policing my body. Look, the government polices your body. When they say that you can't drunk drive, when they say that you can't take certain drugs, when they say that you can't assault someone, when you can't sexually, uh, sexually assault someone, when you can't, uh, when you can't murder someone, that is the government policing your body to protect the rights of other people. And in some cases, even to protect you, but also to protect your community, the people who might be uh, affected by uh, the drugs that you take, by the substances that you buy, the violence that you inflict on those around you. So yes, the government is in the business of policing people's bodies, especially when that body is being used to infringe upon the safety and the rights of another person. And abortion does that. Abortion does that. So really it comes down to whether or not life inside the womb, the human being, that's not a question. It's a human being from the point of conception. It's not anything else. There's nothing else that it can be. It's not a turvis tumbler. It's not a summer squash. It's not maybe going to be a frog from the moment of conception. This is a human being with its own unique DNA. Its gender is already determined at the point of conception. Its eye color is already determined at the point of conception. This is a human being. The entire argument, the entire debate is on whether or not that human being is a person with rights that should be protected. If you are pro-choice, pro-choice, you believe that it should be a choice. It should be legal to kill that child. You don't believe that that is a human being that is worthy of protection. You don't believe that human being has rights. The pro-life side does. 
we all know it's a human being. You can try to argue otherwise, but you would just be scientifically silly at that point. You just don't believe if you're pro-choice that it's a person with value and that has rights. And you need to be able to argue why. Has Xavier Becerra ever done that? Has Kamala Harris ever been able to do that? Has AOC ever been able to do that? Has Joe Biden ever been able to do that? Tell me why. Is it location? Is it size? Is it the stage of development? Is it because they might have a bad life? Is it because there's something wrong with them? All right, apply all of those factors that you use to justify killing the child inside the womb to people outside of the womb and see how far you can go without realizing that your logic makes you a very, very evil person that advocates for murder of human beings just because they can't defend themselves. Like, do you justify murder for human beings who are poor, human beings who are victims of abuse, human beings that might have a bad future, human beings who uh, may be a weight on the system one day, human beings whose parents don't love them or want them, human beings who have a disability, human beings outside of the womb who are smaller than other human beings, less developed than other human beings, less, um, less, uh, less strong, less capable with a lower capacity than other human beings. If you don't use those things to justify killing people outside of the womb, why do you use them as justifications to kill people inside of the womb? Again, just based on their location, based on their size, the pro-choice argument, the pro-abortion argument is cruel. It's illogical. It's incoherent, but mostly it's cruel if you actually accept that you just are for the legal of murder, uh, the legal murder of people based on very, very, arbitrary reasons. And it leads to some very nasty stuff. It leads to advocacy for eugenics and all kinds of brutality of people, not just inside the womb, but outside the womb. And speaking of that, interestingly enough, uh, the mifepristone, uh, the drug actually has ties to uh, Nazi gas camps. I saw that Joel Berry tweeted this. He's of the Babylon Bee. He said, the company that makes mifepristone is the same company that manufactured the Zyklon B gas for the gas chambers in uh, Nazi death camps. And we just wanted to fact check that to make sure that that's true. And it is true. The German chemical chemical company, IG Pharma, uh, Farben, manufactured Zyklon B, the gas chamber poison, among many other products. And its factories exploited more than 35,000 slave laborers, many from Auschwitz. It even built a concentration camp of its own to uh, improve efficiency. IG Farben turned into, I don't even know how to pronounce this, Hoest, uh, Hoest or Hoest, AG upon its name. Oh, it's pronounced Hoyt. Got it in there. Uh, Hoyt, AG upon its name change. According to the New York Times, research for the RU486, known as uh, Mifepristone, uh, began under the, sur- the supervision of French researcher, uh, so many things today, Etienne. Emile Fallou, in conjunction with Rasul Euclaf S.A., the French pharmaceutical company for which he was a consultant, Euclaf was a subsidiary of Hoyt A.G. So in summary, I.G. Farben, manufacturer of Zyklon B, changed its name to Hoyt A.G., one of Hoyt A.G. subsidiaries. Russell Euclaf is the French company that developed RU486 with a Pristone. So it's true. They are the same company. This is the history of abortion. This is the history of abortion methods. This is the history of eugenics. This is the history of Planned Parenthood. It's so funny because you hear the left all the time, the history of this, the roots of that, the origins of that, to try to argue for, I don't know, the immorality of private schools, for example, because some of them, many of them were developed in the 1970s to try to um, resist seg- or desegregation, integration that was happening at the time. That is not a good argument to for me to try to say that private schools are evil today, but that is the argument that they try to use. And yet when it comes to the things that they want, like abortion, like Planned Parenthood, they are totally unwilling to look at the origins, even though it's not just the origins that are evil, it's the thing today that is evil too. Let's think a little bit harder, Christian. Let's think a little bit harder. And just to like bring this full circle, this is a matter of life and death. It does not matter if people call you divisive. It does not matter if people call you mean. It does not matter if people say you being pro-life or anti-abortion is the reason why people aren't Christians anymore. You're anti-woman. You're bigoted. Whatever. It doesn't matter. We're literally talking about babies being brutally murdered and poisoned and dismembered. 
their hearts being stopped at a certain point of pregnancy through a chemical injection that is injected through the woman's abdomen directly into the heart of the wiggling child to force that child into cardiac arrest. That is the same chemical combination that is used in lethal injections to execute murders. Like that's what we're talking about when we're talking about abortion. It's not ambiguous which side God is on. It's not ambiguous which side Christians should be on. And I'm not just talking about morally. I'm also talking about politically. There's no reason for that to be legal in the United States. There's no reason to not legally protect the right of those innocent and vulnerable and defenseless children to live. Okay. This is not a tough one. It's not a tough one for the Christian. These babies are made in the image of God. Um, and it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear what side we should be on. Should we speak the truth in love? Yes. Should we do everything that we can to provide resources for these moms to make sure that they see adoption as an option or parenting as an option? Um, yes, we should. And to make sure that they are well provided for and well protected. But guess what? Christians are already doing that. Anyone says we need to do more work. Why don't you get up off the couch and do more work? I guarantee you there's a pregnancy center within a 60 mile radius of your house that would take your volunteer hours that are already doing the work that you might be saying needs to be done before you can be truly pro-life. Well, put action to your words and to your complaints. The reality is that Christians have been fighting on behalf of these vulnerable families and babies and moms for decades and decades. So go to your local pregnancy center, see how you can help, see how you can donate, see uh, what you can give them to make sure that these moms that are now choosing life and in some cases kind of being forced to choose life because of these laws, praise God, see what they need. That's what we Christians should be doing. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be also speaking the truth, even if you get mean messages about it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Nothing that we endure for being pro-life could be as grotesque, as difficult as what the babies in the womb have to endure who are suffering through abortion. Right? So that's one, that's one perspective. And by the way, like you don't know what babies, what people you are going to meet in heaven who said, Hey, because you talked to my mom, because you donated your time at this pregnancy center because you shared the gospel here because my mom saw your post or whatever it was. She decided not to abort me. And here I am in heaven. I became a Christian. You're part of my testimony because my mom chose life because of you. You might not even realize the lives that God chooses to save through you because of your obedience to him. And you won't get to see the constellation of that person's testimony until glory. That is very worth whatever hate we get today. All right. I got one more sponsor to read you, and then we will head out of here. And that is Bambi. All right. A lot of you are small business owners. And so I don't have to tell you that HR issues can absolutely crush you. They can suck up all of your time. And you probably feel like you can't do anything else. You can't do anything else because you are spending all of your time with onboarding, with terminations, with making sure that everyone's complying with your policies. You don't need to be wasting your time doing that. That's not why you started your business. You want to actually run your company. You need to give HR responsibilities to someone else, but maybe you don't have the margin to pay someone 75 to $85,000 a year to be your dedicated HR person. That's why you need Bambi. With Bambi, you can get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 a month. They're available by phone, email, real-time chat. So onboarding, terminations run really smoothly. Team members can reach peak performance, which is exactly what you want. And your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. So this is, I mean, this is such an awesome service. I love having them as a sponsor because I know how useful this service could be for so many of you who run businesses, especially those small businesses. I mean, this could be a lifesaver. This could literally save your business. You don't have to worry about HR. You also don't have to pay almost $100,000 for an HR manager every year with Bambi. Go to Bambi.com right now. Type in Relatable under podcast, type in relatable under podcast. When you go to Bambi.com, that'll really help the show spell B A M B E -E E.com. Then type in relatable Bambi.com type in relatable. (music) 
All right. We've got a lot coming up this week. There's so much that I want to talk about. Obviously, I want to talk about what happened to Riley Gaines at the San Francisco school. I think it was San Francisco State last week and just the vicious mob that attacked her and what that means about the state of our country. And we'll also talk a a little bit about Bud Light choosing to partner with Dylan Mulvaney. I really tire of talking about this person, but we are going to talk about less about him and more about why corporations are making these choices. And I thought the best person to talk about this with was James Lindsay. You guys know I've had him on my show several times. There's also some disagreements actually that we have um, that I've seen him articulate on Twitter that I want to hash out with him. That's that's probably going to be a two-part interview, probably just because we always have so much to talk about. And you guys love when I have him on. So he is just going to dissect not just what is happening behind all of these things, but why they're happening. I also wanted to talk about this crazy story, Oregon. Um, in Oregon, this mother, Jessica Bates, was prohibited by the state from adopting because she's a Christian and she wouldn't say that she's going to go along with a child saying that they're the opposite gender. And so the state was like, sorry, you can't adopt. But now there's this whole lawsuit. And so I want to get into that and and talk about that. There's just so much, as always, to discuss this week. Feel free to shoot me a message and let me know if there's anything in particular, other things you want to talk about. Oh, also, yes, we're going to talk about the Tennessee Three and this Tennessee legislature. What is actually true about that? And also, are these people like exemplars of Christianity, the things that they're going up and saying about what the Bible has to say about gun violence and all of that? We'll get into that as well. Uh, let's see what else was. Oh, and at some point we're still going to talk about the Florida book banning and so-called and what is actually true about that. We've been like sitting on that story for a while because so many other things have come up. So there's lots of things on the docket. Uh, please leave a five-star review if you love this show and we've got new merch, alimerch.com. Lots of new merch. Mother's Day is coming up. So make sure that you check that out. Ally 10 gets you a 10% off discount. All right. That's all we got for today. We'll see you guys back here tomorrow.